So the first part will be on nucleic acids. So I know we're not going to cover every detail of nucleic acids and transcription and replication and translation. We just don't have time to do that in one lecture. I just want to get the, the main aspects of it across to you. Okay, so we're going to learn what nucleic acids are first. It's one of you, the last of your four major categories of, of biological molecules. And then how they assemble into longer chains, into polymers, DNA and RNA. And then we'll talk about a little bit about uh, translation and transcription of the nucleic acids into protein. Okay, so let's start off at the beginning with a little bit you probably already know. Uh, we have DNA as well, right? Humans do. We have RNA as well. Lots of organisms have DNA and RNA. Some organisms, like some small viruses perhaps, or only have DNA or only have RNA. Right? But every living thing has some nucleic acid information in it. It's where all the genes are stored. So humans, for example, have 23 pairs of chromosomes. They're drawn up there on the right in the cartoon, right? In red. In blue are the chimpanzee chromosomes. You notice they're very similar to ours. We're very similar to chimpanzees genetically. It says 95 to 98.5, depending on what your definition of identical is, um, how you measure it. So nearly identical, but there are some differences. Um, if you count the number of chromosomes, we have 23 pairs, 22 somatic chromosomes listed 1 through 22 and then either an X or a Y, and of course you have another copy of those first 22, and either an X or a Y, right, depending on the gender. Chimpanzees and other hominids like apes and orangutans and bonobos and all those have 24 pairs of chromosomes. 22 of them look exactly like ours, right? Not number two, but numbers one and three through 22, and the X versus Y looks almost identical to ours. There are some base changes, but morphologically they're identical. The main difference is number two. Our human number two is clearly a fusion of two older or more ancient chromosomes, right? So when humans split from the, the tree of hominids, right, in evolution, our two original chromosomes that we call 2A and 2B in those other species, we just call it number two in us, is a fusion of two smaller chromosomes, right? So we've taken the human point of view and calling it number two, but from the other organism's point of view, it's two smaller ones that have fused into one bigger one. Okay? So we're very, very similar to those other organisms, the other hominids, but it's divided into segments of DNA. Whereas some organisms, they only have one single strand of DNA, not multiple segments like this. Okay? So it it's can be done different ways. But let's get back to the basics of it. What are, what are these pieces of DNA? What are they made of? Well, they're made of several things. There's a a biology cartoon down below, a colorful color cartoon there. So it's showing how DNA is put together. There's a sugar, which we went over carbohydrates before. We'll tell you what sugar that is in a second. There's a phosphate group drawn in blue here between the two. And we've already talked about what phosphates are. It's a phosphorus atom surrounded by four oxygens. And then there's some nitrogenous base, right? And I don't mean base like sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. And I don't mean base in one of the amino acids that were basic. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, it's a separate molecule we call a nitrogenous base, right? And there's five possibilities for nucleic acids, and we'll talk about those. Okay? Five basic ones, simple ones. So how they're arranged to each other in this polymer, if you think back the way we did sugars, we simply connected one sugar to the next to make those long polysaccharides, or we just connected two to make a disaccharide, right? or three to trisaccharide, and so forth. And we had polymers such as, you know, malt, not polymers, but disaccharides such as maltose and uh, lactose and sucrose. And then we had long polymers, many, many thousands of sugars put together in the form of starch or chitin or heparin or something like that. Here it's put together a little differently. This is much more like the polymer you made in lab when you were making nylon, where we're gonna put a couple pieces together. We're gonna put a sugar that has a base attached that's the pinkish looking thing with a yellow base attached to it. And then there's a phosphate on it. And bridging that to the next sugar with a base attached. And then there's a phosphate. And then there's another sugar with a base attached and so forth. So it's a repeating unit. So the thing that's repeating in this, if you imagine the, the sugar with the yellow base on top of it and the phosphate just to the left in blue, that unit of three things repeats over and over and over. That unit is called a nucleotide. Right, so it's the, the sugar with the base attached and a single, or more, in this case single, phosphate on it. 
So sugar plus base and phosphate equals nucleotide. Right? That's the repeating unit, the monomeric unit. Okay? And I, I took that figure and popped it again on the next slide in the color at the top so you can see what I'm looking at. That's the repeating unit, that little cartoon thing there with the sugar in pink and the base in yellow and the phosphate in blue. Right? That's not really what they look like. That's a typical biology drawing to get you a concept of how they're put together. If you look at it chemically, it looks like the structure on the right. Right? You're probably used to picking out sugars at this point. Right? We looked at quite a few of them. Do you see that ring structure is a sugar? Right? It's got a bunch of those carbons and oxygens. There's nearly an oxygen on every carbon. And at the top right is one of our five nitrogenous bases. Right? We're going to learn all five of them. That one happens to be one of the five in blue. And then on the left in green, on the left in green is our, is our phosphate group, right? Which in our colorful little image, it was a little blue wedge, but in the structure on the right, it's colored green so, and it's labeled phosphate group. Right? Do you see how it's attached to what was an OH on that carbon? It is now an O phosphate, right? So it used to be an OH on that carbon. That's carbon number five. And now it's just a phosphate. Okay. Normally, there's an OH on every carbon, pretty much, for a sugar. Um, in place of the OH on number one, which number one is this one on the right over here, right, is now where the base is attached in blue. Number two, in this case, doesn't have an OH where it normally would at number two. Number three down here has its OH. Number four, if you remember back to the carbohydrates lecture we did, it's no longer an OH, it's in the ring form. And number five is off the ring, as it was in almost all of our structures of the ring forms. And it's got a phosphate on it. Okay. Another way of looking at that, look at the picture on the bottom left. It's the exact same arrangement, um, except this one's using a different base. Right? It's clearly not the same structure up there. But it's put together the same way. There's some base attached at number one there. There's the ribose sugar below. And then there's a phosphate over on the left top at number five. Right, any questions on those so far? How it's put together? Okay, so if you look at those two drawings I just pointed out, the, the top right and the bottom left, there were two main differences in those two structures. One was fairly obvious. I changed the base. Either it used the smaller base you see in blue at the top right, or there's a larger base drawn on the bottom left one, right? It's got a bigger ring structure there to it. That's a major difference in these two. We'll learn what those bases are in a minute. And the other major change you see is the sugar. The one at the bottom left is your typical ribose. And the one on the top right is ribose, but it's missing something on number two, right? The OH is missing. There's normally an OH on number two, but it's not there. And so I compare those two. Someone could you please mute your microphone? Because it's echoing. So on number, carbon number two at the, the bottom right, I show in both of those sugars, right? The, the left version is the ribose with its two prime OH. And the right version is the deoxyribose with its oxygen missing, with a little tag that says oxygen missing. We went over both of these sugars when we did carbohydrates. And that was really the only difference in the two. We won't go over how it's made. That's an entirely separate lecture for another class. But the, the DNA has the one without the OH. Mommy. Mommy. DNA has the one without the oxygen on number two um, in deoxyribose. And RNA has the ribose with the OH on number two. It's just called regular ribose. So that's where we get the R for ribose in RNA, ribonucleic acid. And Technically, I guess we should call it DRNA. It's a deoxyribose nucleic acid, but we've lost that and just call it DNA on the right. And so there's two major differences between RNA and DNA. One is the sugar. Ribose in RNA, deoxyribose in DNA. It gives them their initials and their names. The other major difference between RNA and DNA is the base that was attached, right? We can attach several different bases to each of these sugars, right? There's four possibilities in RNA, and there's four possibilities in DNA, three of which overlap with each other. Okay? There's this misconception that RNA is single-stranded and DNA is double-stranded. 
Well, that's the ones they tend to teach you, and they teach mRNA, and they teach double-stranded DNA. But in fact, RNA and DNA can both be, both exist as double or single-stranded, right? You're just looking at a narrow one possibility when you say one or the other. So don't say RNA is always single-stranded, and don't say it's always double-stranded. Same goes for DNA. Don't say it's single or double all the time. It's not. Okay, so the main structural differences between RNA and DNA are the sugars, which we just went over, and the possibility of bases that could be attached, which we're going to do next. Okay, so here's our nitrogenous bases. They come in two flavors. The top flavor are called purines, and that's the ones at the top row up there. They have two rings in their structure, right? Two fused rings. And then the other flavor is called pyrimidines, right? And there's three possibilities for those. And they only have one ring in their structure, right? So the, the top ones up there, the purines, the, the first molecule with the numbers in it just lists the generic purine. And there's two types, adenine and guanine. We're going to call them A and G for short. And so adenine and guanine look very much alike. They differ only in the things attached to the six-membered ring. Right? One of them has an amino group up there. One of them has a carbonyl up there. Right? The pyrimidines underneath come in three different types. Right? Again, there's a six-membered ring. And the cytosine, which we'll call C, uracil, we'll call U, and thymine, we'll call T, they differ in, again, what's attached at the very top. They all have that carbonyl on the bottom left, but what's attached at the top varies, either an amino group or a carbonyl. And the only difference between uracine, uracil and thymine is that methyl group. Right? That's it. And so do I want you to memorize all these structures? You don't have to. I'm going to teach you an easy way to remember which one's which. Okay, so even if you are given uh, a blank sheet of paper, you can almost draw them. Or if you're given a lineup and had to pick one out of the crowd, you can easily do it. Okay, so if I give you a picture of all of these, which is the way I'll do it, you can easily pick one out of the lineup. Like, that's definitely guanine. It'll make it easy for you. So how do you go about distinguishing these? So if you, if you were to cover up all these names, how do you tell them apart? Well, an easy way to do it is to remember adenine and guanine are the two purines. So if you see a double ring, those are your only options. And the C, U, and T are the only pyrimidines. Right? So if you see a pyrimidine, just a single ring, you only have three options. So you don't have to memorize five options. Right? Another thing to tell that you're actually looking at the correct structure is, can you notice in every single ring there are exactly two nitrogens? Pick any ring on any of those five structures, there's exactly two nitrogens in those rings. I don't mean things attached to the ring, I mean in the ring itself. So every ring you see up there has exactly two nitrogens. Okay. So now we only have to answer three questions. How do I tell apart A from G? Because if you see a double ring, you know it's a purine. How do you tell A from G? If you see a single ring, how do you tell C from U and U from T? Right. The easy way to tell them apart is to remember what binds with what. Right. So look down below real quick. And the ones I have a color there, and you probably already knew this, but adenine pairs with T, right, in DNA. If it were RNA, it would pair with U. The only difference is that methyl group you see on the top right. And if the methyl were not there, that would be a uracil. But it binds in exactly the same manner, right? A with T or A with U. They make two hydrogen bonds, shown by the dotted lines. If you look in the, the yellow or golden colored ones below, G pairs with C, and that's true in both DNA and RNA, right? And it makes three hydrogen bonds, okay? So a G-C pair is slightly stronger, tighter interaction, more affinity than an A-T pair would be, or an A-U pair would be. And we'll leave it with that. We're not going to get into any odd or unusual pairings here, but the basics. So if I asked you to tell A from G, an easy way to remember it is look at the structure of adenine up there. It has a severe lack of oxygen. In fact, it only has five carbons, five hydrogens, and five nitrogens. It's basically five cyanide molecules put together. Like that's it. So adenine has no oxygen. Guanine has an oxygen. So that's an easy way to tell those two apart. If I give you a picture and you can identify it instantly as a purine because you see the two rings, then ask yourself, does it have an oxygen? If it does, guanine. If it does not, adenine. All right, we'll stick with just those simple basic ones. All right? If you see a single ring, you confirm that it has two nitrogens. It's one of the real ones. 
right? How do you tell C from U and T? How many oxygens does cytosine have? One. How many oxygens do uracil or thymine have? Two. So I can easily tell cytosine from the other two, right? Adenine had no oxygen, guanine had one. Cytosine has one, uracil and thymine each have two. So the only real question left is how do you tell uracil from thymine? Well, thymine has a methyl group. The word methyl almost looks like the name of thymine. Rearrange the letters a little bit, we're missing a couple, but it looks nothing like the word uracil. So if you can't remember which one has the methyl group, the word methyl looks a lot more like thymine than it does the word uracil. And so you can tell all five of those apart. How do you remember which one pairs with which? Adenine, we said, pairs with thymine, or adenine pairs with uracil. Guanine always pairs with cytosine. Well, in the sum of an AT or AU or GC pair, any of those appropriate pairings, the total number of oxygens is always two. So in an AT pair, you remember A has no oxygen. T has exactly two oxygens. So an AT pair would have a sum of two oxygens. An AU pair would again have two oxygens. Zero plus two is two. A GC pair would again have two oxygens, one from the G, one from the C. So in any pairing, you'll only have two oxygens total. If that helps you remember their names, their structures, and how they pair with each other. Okay? So if I give you a lineup of these structures without their names, you can pin the labels on each one. You know what they look like. Okay, so I want you to remember which ones are in DNA and which ones are in RNA. That's a really easy question. Um, C, G, and A are in both. But thymine is exclusive to DNA and uracil is exclusive to RNA. Right, they kind of teach, take each other's place, and they're only a methyl group apart. Okay, well, let's look at putting these together now. So let's say we make some uh, DNA, which is on the right of this picture, and some RNA on the left of the picture. And the only difference in the two, again, is there's two things. One is the DNA on the right, you notice, does not have an OH on the two prime position, but it does have an OH on the RNA at two prime. And, of course, the bases we just went over could be different. In RNA, you're going to have U's, C's, G's, or A's. And in DNA, you're going to have T's, C's, G's, and A's. All right? It just says base on here. All right? And let's go over the, the bonds between the two. And I did that a few slides back. I just skipped over it for you. Look at the bottom left here. The base, and quiz you real quick, which base is that? Is it a purine or pyrimidine? All right? This base on the bottom left here. Which base is this? It's got two rings, so it must be a purine. And then your question is, is it an A or a G? Well, I see an oxygen, so it can't be an A. It must be a guanine, so that's a G. Right? What connects that base to the ribose is called a glycosidic bond. We've seen this before when we did carbohydrates. When you connect a bond to a sugar, it's a glycosidic bond. Okay? On the right-hand side, or sorry, on the left-hand side of this, we have our phosphate. The phosphate is attached to carbon number 5 through what was an OH. That's a phosphoester. Do you see if the phosphorus, the little p, was a carbon that would be an ester? Right? It's a typical C double bond O, OR group. But it's not a carbon, it's a phosphorus, so it's called a phosphoester instead of a normal ester. Okay? That same drawing down here below, right? which base is this? in my box drawing this time. Well, it's got two rings, so it's clearly a purine again. And I don't see any oxygens, so this must be adenine. All right, so this one is adenine. Connected to carbon number one again, or the ribose. One, two, three, four, five carbons. Five is off the ring, as we learned before. This is a called a glycosidic bond again. Now this time I'm telling you it's a beta-glycosidic bond. If you think back to the carbohydrates lecture we did, remember up was beta. If the what was an OH and is now a ring, would be pointed down, it would have been called alpha, right? So these are beta glycosidic bonds, right? This one doesn't have a phosphate on it. On the carbon number five, it's just an OH. So this would be called a nucleoside, not a nucleotide. And that's the only difference in the two. And we'll, we'll cover that. I have a picture of it coming up soon too. But let's take one of these and look at it on the right. So look at the, the very far right of the picture where you have the, the bases over here without their two prime OH, it just says H on number two, right? Do you notice, let's pick one in particular, like the, the base in the middle that's in pinkish red. 
Okay, it's got a, got a yellow word base attached to the ribose, which is in red, right? That sugar is attached to a base and a phosphate, and I'm counting the phosphate that's in black above it, okay? So that phosphate is attached on the five prime carbon, right? I know the five prime is written on the O, but it's the five prime carbon they're referring to. That's where the phosphate is. And the base is attached at one prime, like shown in the drawing on the bottom, okay? The next nucleotide was the, the base below it in black attached to a black sugar with a blue phosphate, right? And you see that just repeats over and over and over. So the new connection between one nucleotide and the next is the three prime carbon through the blue phosphate there. That's the new connection I made when I put these together. That's similar to looking back here and asking what nucleotide was attached to what here. So this base in the center with its purple or pink or red or orange, or not orange, but whatever pink sugar there, attached to its phosphate on the left, that's on its five prime side. That's this little thing I drew here for you. Okay, so the yellow base with the, the pinkish sugar and the blue phosphate, it's green in the drawing on the right, I know, but that's my nucleotide unit. It would connect to the next sugar's OH, and that's what I'm showing here. Okay, so the only difference in these between RNA and DNA is the various bases I can put on, they're connected the same way, and whether or not it has that OH on number two. That's the only two differences between RNA and DNA structurally. Functionally, there's quite a few differences, but structurally, that's the only two. They can both be double-stranded, they can both exist as single-stranded, none of that other simplification is, is true. Okay. So here's a, a molecule made from one of those things. Right? You've probably heard of ATP before. ATP is not a big ball of energy as it's represented in many lower level classes. Right? It's a molecule. Right? And if you look at the bottom, there's an, uh, a base on the right attached at the number one position again. Again, it's attached up, so it's a beta attachment. And which base is this? Well, it's got two rings, so we can definitely rule out pyrimidines. It's definitely a purine. And I don't see any oxygens on those rings, so it must be adenine. All right, so this is adenine, not guanine. Is this ribose or deoxyribose? Well, how would I tell? Well, I look at the two prime position. It has an OH, so this is regular old ribose, not deoxyribose. And then on the five prime carbon, there are three consecutive phosphates, right? Not just one, but three. So there's an alpha, beta, and gamma phosphate. That's how we refer to them, All right? So this has three phosphates on it. If you just wanted to name the base on the far right, we call it adenine. When you put it on the sugar, right, no phosphates yet, just the base on the sugar, we name it adenosine. I'm not going to make you memorize those names. I'm just saying the name changes somewhat. When you put the base on the sugar, we call it adenosine, and those are called nucleosides because it's a nucleobase attached to the side of a sugar. So we get the shortened name nucleoside. Right? Once we add a phosphate or more phosphates, the nucleoside side name becomes a nucleotide, right? So this at the bottom is called ATP because it's adenosine triphosphate. So the base and the sugar together make adenosine, and then it has one, two, three phosphates, so triphosphate. That's what the TP stands for. If it only had two phosphates, it would be ADP, diphosphate. If it only had one phosphate, it would be AMP, monophosphate. If it had no phosphates, we simply call it adenosine. Okay, so I wrote some questions on the slide here. It says ribonucleotides contain three potential OH groups, right? At two, three, and five. Why not at one or four? Well, number one is where the base is attached. That OH has been replaced by a base, so there's clearly no OH there. And number four is now involved in the ring, right? Remember we took our sugars and made them to their ring forms? The Penultimate OH, the, the last chiral center, is the one that attacks the carbonyl and becomes involved in the ring. So it can't be an OH anymore. So that leaves OHs on numbers 2, 3, and 5. And we put the phosphates on number 5 here. So it's assumed to be a 5 prime phosphate unless we state otherwise. I could say it's a 3 prime ATP. Then there'd be 3 phosphates down here instead. Okay? But if this were DNA, this OH at number 2 would not be there. Right? So I can say deoxyribonucleotides, not ribonucleotides, can only have OHs on 3 or 5. Why not at 2? Because 
we purposely removed it to make it deoxy. Right? So the only positions we could attach things now are on three or five, if it's deoxy. And that's what we did back here when we made these connections. They were between the three and fives. Same thing with RNA, between three and five. Yeah. Okay, let's do a little practice questions. Make sure you understand those concepts. So at the top is my little figure again. I'm putting ribose together with adenine, right? And adenine has no oxygen. You probably guessed that from the structure. We've done this a couple times now. And this ribose, carbon number one, we call it the anomeric carbon. If you think back to the carbohydrates lecture, when we made this into its ring form, this was a new chiral center. It wasn't before, it was an aldehyde. And now it's got four different things attached. So it's a new chiral center. And it could have been up or down, beta or alpha. In this case, it's beta, it's up. And that's where we're gonna attach the adenine. How do I attach it? Well, the OH leaves along with the H highlighted in red here. That's a great leaving group, water. We've done this before when we put our sugars together, right? It's exactly the same thing. And then this nitrogen becomes attached to that carbon at that position, right? So on the previous slides, I called it a glycosidic bond. Then I was more specific and called it a beta glycosidic bond. Now I'm being very specific and calling it a beta nitrogen glycosidic bond or beta N glycosidic bond because that's what's attached. Had it been an oxygen, it would be a beta O glycosidic bond. But as you know, adenine has no oxygens. So all these bases are attached to their nitrogens, not oxygen. Okay, so adenine, once put on the sugar, is called adenosine. This is a nucleoside. And if I attach phosphates, it becomes a nucleotide. So the difference between the difference between a nucleotide and a nucleoside is the absence or presence of a phosphate. So I, better sh I should say it, the difference between a nucleotide and a nucleoside is the presence or absence, respectively, of a phosphate. So nucleotides have one or more phosphates, nucleosides lack phosphates. They're just the sugar in the base. Okay. What are the two purine residues, right, or two purine bases? Well, those are the ones with the double ring structure, the two rings, and that was adenine and guanine. Can you tell the two apart? Adenine has no oxygen, guanine has an oxygen. Identify the three pyrimidines. Well, they're only single ring structures, right? Still has two nitrogens in the ring, but single rings, not fused rings. And how do you tell them apart? Well, cytidine had one oxygen. Uracil and thymine each had two oxygens. And then it becomes, how do I tell uracil from thymine? Thymine has a methyl group, uracil did not. Okay, so putting all that together, can you tell me what this one is at the bottom? The first thing we should look for is identify the sugar. This is the sugar. Is it ribose or deoxyribose? I look here at the two prime position, right? There is an OH, so it's not deoxy, it's regular old ribose, right? What is the base attached? Well, I see a single ring, not a double ring, so it's a pyrimidine, one of our three pyrimidines. It has two oxygens, so that rules out cytidine, right, or cytosine. It leaves me with the choice of uracil or thymine. I do not see a methyl group here, right? In fact, I don't see a methyl group anywhere, right? It would be here, but I don't see one, so this must be uracil, right? So this would be uracil attached to a ribose that's called uridine, right? And is this a nucleotide or a nucleoside? Well, I check for phosphates. I don't see any phosphates on this thing. They'd most likely be here on number five, but I don't see any at all. So it is a nucleoside, not a nucleotide. Had it had a phosphate, it would be a nucleotide, right? In fact, it would be UMP, uridine monophosphate, if it had one phosphate. It would be UDP if it had two, UTP if it had three, right? We just replaced the, the A and ATP with whatever base it is, C, G, U, whatever, okay? Okay, let's look at some more DNA molecules. I put the same ones on the right over here again with some orientations for you. So these molecules have directionality. You're familiar with this concept because we did proteins just recently. And when you put your amino acids together, we said we, we don't just put them haphazardly in any order. There's an order to them. And the primary structure was reading them off to you one end to the other. We always read it from the amino side to the carboxy side, never the other way. So that's the order that they're assembled. So DNA is kind of the same way. We read it in the order it was assembled. So we call that the five prime to the three prime. But this can be confusing the first few times you look at it. So 
This molecule has polarity, and the way I'm, way I'm saying five to three, you can get confused if you look at the wrong fives and threes. And so let's look at our base here again in, in pink, right? The yellow base on the pink sugar. This sugar has five carbons. Number one, where the base is attached. Number two, where there's still an OH on the RNA version. Number three, where the blue phosphate's attached. Number four, where the oxygen that's in the ring is attached. And number five just says H2C, where the black phosphate's attached. Right? So that carbon in, in pink, where it says H2C, is carbon number five. The carbon where the blue phosphate's attached is carbon number three. Which direction is five to three in the sugar itself? Well, that's from up to down. So we call this direction top to bottom, five to three. You could easily get confused by looking at only the phosphates and going the other way, right? But always look at a single sugar. Pick any sugar you want, just like we did with the amino acids. It had to be, you know, amino group, alpha carbon, carbonyl, amino group, alpha carbon, carbonyl. You never went the other direction. So we pick, this, pick any sugar you want, find carbon number five, find carbon number three, and that's the direction the chain is going. So for the first one, it's going down, okay? If you look at the other blue arrow I drew going up, that would be incorrect, right? It looks like five to three is going in that direction if you looked only at the blue phosphate, but that's incorrect. You gotta use the scheme on the left. I drew both of these and you can see a potential test question is pick which way it's going. Okay, so the correct answer is the one on the left. It's going down five to three, as is the DNA going down. This arrow pointing up is incorrect. So choose the right one on the test. Okay, and some sizes. How long do these things get? All right, we said the human chromosomes are 23 in number, 23 pairs, right? And the first one we have, number one, you saw was the largest. Number 22 is the smallest of the somatic chromosomes. And we leave X and Y off by themselves. We took them out of the size numbering list because they were quite unique. But number one is about a quarter billion base pairs, 250 million base pairs. Whereas number two is only one-fifth that size, about 50 million base pairs, right? So they vary in size quite a bit, but all of those are enormous compared to, say, E. coli, a bacteria, right? It has one strand of DNA that's only 4.6 million nucleotides long, right? So it's one piece compared to our smallest piece is still less than one-tenth the size of our smallest piece. So we have way more DNA, roughly a thousand times more DNA than E. coli does, right? We're a much more complex organism, right? A larger organism. But 4.6 million bases is not small, right? That's still a large number if you had to write them all out, okay? All right, so one more time, the directionality. Uh, I found these other pictures to help you learn the directionality here. So the picture on the left shows a strand going from top to bottom, where if you were to read the bases, it would read T, C, A. We always read these things out loud, five to three. Okay? If, if you see a DNA strand, or RNA strand for that matter, written on a piece of paper, and there's no designation on which end is which, assume it's written five to three. Okay? If you see designations that say five to three or three to five, that's what it is. But if you don't see any, any orientations on the end of it, assume it's written five to three. So if I were to write the strands on the left out, it would read T, C, A. If I would write the other strand, the one to which it's binding, it would read T, G, A, right? I read it from bottom to top because that's five to three. Pick any one sugar, I label two of them for you, right? So pick any one sugar you want. This is the number ones where the base is attached. This is two, three, four, five. How do I know to go this way around the ring instead of counterclockwise? Because if I go the other way, I end up with one, this would be an oxygen, right? It's not labeled in this figure, but that would be an oxygen, right? And then I couldn't get to a number five. So it'd be one, two, three, four, five, if I count clockwise around the ring, right? In the case over here, it would be one, two, three, four, five. Same thing, this would be an oxygen on this ring, this would be an oxygen on this ring, okay? Just not shown in the structure. Another way of looking at it, yet another figure on the right, shows the bases. A pairing with T, G with C, and so forth, just like we did here. Three hydrogen bonds between G, C pairs, two hydrogen bonds between A, T, or T, A pairs. Okay. All right, let's put those structures in motion. Look at the bottom right. You can see, hopefully, it's turning on your screen as well. 
Uh, it's a little animation that shows how these things are put together. You've probably heard it's a double helix. That just means two strands that twist around one another. And if you look back for a second, this is a very accurate drawing as far as what's pairing with what and what bases are making contacts with, with each other as far as how the phosphodiester bonds go. But it doesn't show you it in three dimensions. How does this really look? It's not like rungs on a ladder. It's twisted on itself. And that's what this is. If this ladder were twisted on itself. Remember, if I pick one of these strands, let's play, say the blue strand here, and follow it, it would go in this direction, right, down. But the purple or pink strand would be going up the other direction. Right, so one is going up top to bottom, the other is going bottom to top, and they wrap around each other. Right? If you notice in the middle, all the base pairs are like you see them here on this image, but turned 90 degrees to us, as if we were they were turned on the edge so you can't see them. That's what this is. They're all turned on edge. Any one of these, if you were to look at it from the top, you'd see the purine and the pyrimidine next to each other. And that's the little inset to the top right. Also shown in this rotating diagram, you see all the base pairs are flat to us. The rings are edge on as we see them going around. Right? So the rings all stack with each other as they go around. Right? Because of this, this thing adopts a certain conformation. Right? They wrap around each other. Well, where the backbone is, is kind of a ridge, right? We can see these backbone ridges sticking out. That's all these phosphates we keep seeing on the outside. And where the bases are, and there's no ridge above them, we call these grooves. You see, there's a groove in this thing, right? And if you look at this molecule from the edge, right? If I look at it here, from one peak to the next, this would be the depth of that groove, right? I know you guys can't see my mouse if you're watching the screen, but it will be in the video. Right, so this is the depth of that groove. This is the smaller groove. It has a more shallow depth. Right? It's not quite as wide as this one is, and it's not as deep as this one is. So this one we're going to call the major groove because it's wide and deep. Right? This is the width of it here, and the depth can be seen from the profile edge here. And then the minor groove is this one along here, where this is the depth, right? and this is the width. Or, oops. If you look at it this way, this is the width. Okay. These are the ridges along the backbone. Okay. Major groove. And you notice the major groove will wrap around the backside here and come out here, keep going. The minor groove goes around the backside here, comes out here, and keeps going. Okay. Do you want you to memorize any of these numbers? A couple. I'd like you to know two facts about it. It takes roughly 10 bases to turn all the way around. Right. So if I pick a point, let's say where this indicator is, right here, and I count the number of base pairs, it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and behind there would be 10, and I'm back to where I started. Right, so it's roughly 10 pairings from any one spot till it turns completely around. If you try to catch this thing, if it wasn't turning, you can do that. Right? It would be 10 pairs as it turns around completely. So pick any point you want, and when it repeats that point, it's turned all the way around, 360 degrees, it took 10 base pairs to do that. If it takes 10 base pairs to turn all the way around, all the way around being 360 degrees, how far does each one turn? So that would be 360 degrees divided by 10. So each one turns 36 degrees. So if you look at this figure, every one of these is twisted 36 degrees with respect to the next. That gives it the appearance of a helix. Okay. Also, from one position to the next, the other number I want you to know is three, 34 angstroms, right? What's an angstrom? An angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters, or about one-tenth of a nanometer, or about the size of a hydrogen atom. Why pick such an odd measurement, right? We like to do things in 10 to the minus 3, minus 6, minus 9, you know, the milli, micro, nano scale, right? So why pick a, an off 3 base? Well, if I asked you to measure the distance between your house and your best friend's house in a straight line, you could hop on a map and do it, you would not give me the answer in inches. Right? It would be a ridiculous measurement. You'd probably give me the answer in miles or kilometers or something like that, a more reasonable measurement. Right? If I asked you to measure uh, how wide is the window in your house, right? you wouldn't give me the answer in kilometers because that would be a ridiculously small number. You'd probably give me the answer in feet or inches or meters or something like that, something reasonable. So I need a measuring stick on the scale of the thing I'm measuring. So 
In the case of this, I'd like to say how far is this distance between one part of the DNA and when it turns completely around, 360 degrees. I need a measuring stick I can understand. If I gave you this measurement in meters, it wouldn't make any sense, right? It'd be, you know, 3.4 times 10 to the minus 10 meters, or 34 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. You can't visualize that. So what if I told you it's 34 hydrogen atoms wide? So an angstrom is about the width of a hydrogen atom. It's not exact, but it's on par with a hydrogen atom, right? It's on that scale. So if I told you that I could fit 34 hydrogen atoms back to back in that gap or in this distance, you can visualize 34 bubbles sitting in there, and that's about how far apart they are. And it's just a scale that you can make sense. You need a measuring instrument on the size of the thing you're measuring. That's why we use angstroms. Okay, so it's 34 hydrogen atoms from one point to other when it turns around. Okay, so if it takes 34 angstroms to cover that distance, right, 34 hydrogen atoms wide, and there's 10 bases in that turnaround, how far is it between one pairing and the next? In other words, from this pairing here to this pairing here. Well, again, there's 10 bases. You can take this 34, divide by 10, and get 3.4 angstroms. So one base to the next is 3.4 angstroms across from one, or not across, but from one to the next one. So in the, in the spinning diagram, that's from one pair to the next pair below it or above it is 3.4 angstroms. So you could squeeze three to four hydrogen atoms between them, right? They're not actually really close, but they're not very far away. Hopefully those numbers can make sense. It's nice because there's 10 bases. You can divide both of those by 10 rather easily. Okay, a few more things to go. and We'll talk about three processes real quick that we don't have time to do full lectures for, but I want you to have your appreciation for it. So DNA can do a couple things. In their, their, when, you, when you're looking at the grand scheme of things, where you go from DNA to RNA to protein, right? It's sometimes called the central dogma. Right, so DNA can make a copy of itself, that's called replication. Right, so you start with one original DNA molecule and you get two and you're done. How does it do that? They spent several years, part, better part of a decade figuring that out. So the molecule doesn't pose for a portrait and a brand new DNA molecule assembled from the portrait. It doesn't really make sense, and that's energetically possible. What happens is the two strands of a double-stranded DNA pull apart, that's called denaturation, just like we did with proteins. It loses its folding structure, loses its nature, but its primary structure is still intact, right? The backbone is still intact. And from each of those, since they base pair with the other base, if I pull these two apart, I know what base goes on the other side. So if I were to pull these two strands apart and the strand on the right was gone, I would ask across from T, what should I put there? Well, it's always an A. And across from C is always a G, across from G is always a C, across from A is always a T, and so forth. So if I pull these two strands apart, the DNA strand, the single strand, has all the information I need to reproduce the other strand that's missing. And that's exactly what happens. So the DNA polymerase reads the base on that side and incorporates a new base, the appropriate base, on the other side. And of course you get the other strand doing the same thing and you end up with two identical copies. Occasionally the DNA polymerase will make a mistake. Right? And that's how we introduce some mutations into our DNA. If that DNA happens to be in a, a sperm or egg cell that's going to become a new organism, that mutation is passed on to the next generation. If it happens to occur in a somatic cell, it's never passed on, but it could cause issues for that somatic cell. And some cancers develop that way. Okay, so if I do one round of replication, one DNA double-stranded piece will become two. If I do another round, it doubles and I get four. If I do a third round, it doubles, I get eight, and so forth. If I do 15 rounds of this, how many will I have when I'm done? Two to the 15th power. Right? If I do 50 rounds of this, I'll have two to the 50th power. So this amplifies exponentially. Right? The last two processes I want to talk about are the other two. DNA can make copies of itself, of course. But we also turn DNA into an RNA copy. Right? And I have a, a, a simple way to help you remember transcription from translation. Think of transcription as transcribing a book, just like you would. You pick up an old book. The monks used to do this before we had copiers, right? The, they would look at one page of the book and transcribe it onto a brand new page with ink or blood or whatever they were using, all right, and make a copy of that book. 
they might write it in a different dialect, right? That for every S they find, they might make it look like an F in the old English version, right? But it's the same wording, it's just a different dialect, right? So in our case, for DNA and RNA, we're going to take the DNA strand information, that sequence, and make an RNA strand, except for everywhere we find an A, across from the A, instead of putting T, we're going to put a U, right? So when we're done, the RNA looks just like the DNA did, except everywhere there was a T, there's a U now, right? So it's the same language. They both use the same letters, A's, C's, G's, and either U or T, but now it's just RNA, right? I used a different sugar, I used a different set of bases, but it's the same language, just a different dialect, so it's transcribed. Once that mRNA is used by the ribosome and made into protein, we're now translating it. This is like taking Old English, right? You find a book in Old English and you write it into Modern English where you make all your letters look the same and we don't misspell as many words as we used to. And it's very organized, now we have RNA. But I want to translate that into, say, Italian or Spanish or Russian or something like that. It's a totally different language. It uses a different alphabet, perhaps, especially if you're changing it to, say, Hebrew or Russian or Chinese, right? The, the characters are different. I right? use a different alphabet. So here we're going from a DNA and RNA nucleic acid alphabet into a protein alphabet. You guys memorized your uh, protein short letters, the one-letter descriptions. So if I start out with a, an alpha, a message that has A's, T's, C's, and U's, I'm going to turn that into a string of letters that are proteins now. Right? It might be serine, lysine, glutamic acid, tryptophan, and another serine. I don't know what the sequence might be, but that's an example. Right? So I'm changing languages. That protein is a consequence of the translation. Transcription, same language, different dialect. Translation, a whole new language. I'm not even making it out of nucleic acid anymore. I'm making it out of amino acids. hope you can tell those two apart. Okay. At the bottom of the slide here are two things that I want to go over that eukaryotes do that prokaryotes do not do. Okay? In a prokaryote, like a E. coli, bacterial cell, something like that, very simple, every time they make an RNA message from the DNA, it makes one protein. Right? So one DNA strand makes one mRNA, makes one protein. There are some mRNAs with multiple transcripts on it, but we're not going to talk about those. But one piece of DNA, one message, makes one mRNA message and makes one protein. There's no chance to edit it. There's no chance to, to fix mistakes. There's no chance to make other things. Whereas in eukaryotes, I'm sorry, by, by the way, the, in prokaryotes, those happen simultaneously. As you're making the mRNA, the ribosome is right there. Everything's happening in the cytoplasm all at once. In fact, the protein is being made before the mRNA is even finished. Whereas in eukaryotes, we separate the processes both temporally in time and spatially by positioning and distance and separation into compartments. So we make our mRNA in the nucleus, in fact we make all RNA in the nucleus, and then that mRNA gets processed, right? We do some things to it, right? And then it's shipped out to the cytoplasm where ribosomes can finally translate it into a protein. Okay, so our processing that we do is a little different. We can take some sections of the mRNA, we call them introns, and they're shown in the green on the left, and the, I guess, reddish on the right. I'm sorry, their colors don't match. And then we take those out, put all the exons back together, that's orange on the left and green on the right. I'm sorry, the colors are backwards. And we put all the exons back together, introns have been removed, that much smaller piece now goes out to the cytoplasm, right? It may obtain a poly A tail or something like that to protect it and a cap, but we're not gonna talk about those too much. But it goes out into the cytoplasm and is translated by the ribosome. Now, could you imagine, instead of taking out those introns, I decided to take out different ones and leave some other gaps in there. Instead of using exons 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, I might only put together exons 1, 2, 4, and 5. I leave out number 3. I'm not going to use it. So when I splice it back together, it's missing a part. Or it's got additional parts. That message would give me a different protein. Right? The sequence will be different. So we have the option, as eukaryotes, to make lots of different proteins from the same original DNA, whereas prokaryotes can't do that. It's one DNA message, one mRNA, one protein. Ours, one DNA message could be spliced many, many different ways, sometimes hundreds of different ways, if it's talking about uh, antib antibodies. We talked about how diverse those could be. Right? So we splice them all together, 
we get multiple possible proteins out of it. Each mRNA that results from the splicing can only make one protein, but we could get many different splicing options. So that's the difference between spliced DNA and eukaryotes, and prokaryotes do not do that. One DNA message, one mRNA message, one protein. Okay. All right, and lastly, we had to come up with a code for how the what you translate from the nucleotide language into the protein language. All right, and this took a decade in the late 50s, early 60s to do this, and they had to figure out how it works. So if you imagine an RNA strand, right, let's, make, let's say the RNA strand was made entirely of uracil. No other base there, just a string of hundreds of uracils, back to back to back, right? And they made such an mRNA, just a bunch of mR, a bunch of uracils back to back. And every time they gave that to a ribosome, it would always make the same protein. Well, that makes sense. It's getting the same message. But how does it know what to make? So if you put a bunch of U's together, that's it, only uracils, you would always end up with the same protein, just a string of phen phenylalanines, and that's it. It always put phenylalanine in every single time, just a string of those hooked together. So if you read the primary structure of that protein, it would read phenylalanine, 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 as many as you did, right? Never changes. So the first obvious thought is uracil codes for phenylalanine. Every time it sees a uracil, it puts in a phenylalanine. That's not a bad thought, but then it occurred to them, if that's the case, what's the most diverse number of amino acids you could select for? Well, I only have U's, C's, G's, and A's. I would only have four possible amino acids. That can't be the way it's done because we have 20 amino acids, right? They already knew this. So the next thought was, what if I read them two at a time, like two word blocks? If I read UU, that gives me phenylalanine, right? How many possibilities would there be then? Well, there's a UU, UA, UC, and UG. But of course, it doesn't have to start with U. I could have CU, CA, CC, and CG as well. So if you take two of them at a time, your possibilities balloon up to not four, but 16 possibilities, right? Because there's four at each spot. Four times four is 16. Well, even with that, that can't be the way it's done because we have 20 amino acids. They knew this. So they did the next logical thing. What if it's read three at a time, right? So you read three bases at a time. And that gives you, as you see on the picture here, 64 possibilities because four times four times four is 64. Well, that's more than enough to cover the 20 amino acids. It also provides for ways to start the sequence with the AUG as a start codon, right? Or ways to terminate the sequence. It has to stop somewhere. And we have a series of stop codons up there as well, right? So this was one option. It wasn't guaranteed to be correct. Who knows? We could read them four or five bases at a time. They didn't know. But one or two was not sufficient to provide enough d diversity to give you 20 amino acids. So they tested this over the next decade and found out it does indeed read them three at a time. And this is our code on the right. So this is the genetic code that comes from this. So the mRNA is read three bases at a time, and those three bases code for a particular amino acid. Now, sometimes the coding is quite redundant, right? So if it starts with, for example, CCU or CCC or CCA or CCG, it's clear that CC, and it's irrelevant what the third base would be, always codes for proline. So there's some ambiguity, so not ambiguity, but redundancy or degeneracy built into the code. However, there is no ambiguity in the code. CCC will always code for proline. It never codes sometimes arginine. That's not the case. So one codon will always be the same amino acid, but there are several possible codons for many amino acids. Like there's four for proline, there's four for threonine, there's three for isoleucine, there's actually six for leucine and so forth, right? So do I want you to memorize this chart? Absolutely not, right? That, that's just too much. You can use the chart. But what I want you to be able to do is use the chart. If I give you a sequence, you can read off what it would make, right? We'll do some examples in your practice tests. All right, so if I gave you a sequence of mRNA and the first three bases were A, U, U, right? What would you tell me the amino acid should be? So AUU, you look in the third row, that's where A is. And then the first column, that's where U is in the second position. And then AUU is at the top of the list. And it says ILE, which is isoleucine. All right, so you put isoleucine in. It's one letter code would be I, right? If the next three letters were AAA, well, you look in the third row, third column, 
third one in that chart, third one in that box, AAA codes for lysine. So you'd write K as the one letter code for lysine index. So it says IK so far. And you keep going. If the next three bases, for example, were G, G, A, you'd look in the fourth row, fourth column, third one in that box, G, G, A codes for glycine. So now we have I, K, G. And if the next one read U, A, A, right, you look in the first row, third column, third one in the block, U, A, A, it says stop. What do I put there? I don't put anything there. I don't write the word stop. I just follow the instructions. I stop. That protein is done. It's simply U, K, G, and I stop. I don't add anything else. Just follow the instructions. So if you run across the stop codon, you do what it says. That's the end of the protein. All right. Any questions on those so far before we do your practice questions?